Stories of the Science podcast with your girl and with an E. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Root of the Science podcast with your girl and with an E. If you are new here, welcome, welcome, welcome. It's so amazing having you as a new listener and I hope you stay. To all my regular listeners, I am back. Yes, I know you've missed me. We are back. We are back. Had a slight hiatus of like April. No, 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 March. But we are back in full swing now. A reminder that you can stay up to date with all the new episodes by hitting the subscribe button or follow button on Spotify and your Apple podcast or wherever else you listen to your podcast. Um, Remember to follow this podcast on various social medias, on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter at The Root of the Science Pod. We are available on LinkedIn and Facebook at The Root of the Science Podcast. Make sure that you share and like. A reminder that if you'd like to collaborate on an episode or do something really cool, make sure that you send me an email or you'd like us to work together, please do send me an email. And most importantly, if you're listening to this and you're like, so-and-so needs to be on this podcast or you yourself need to be on this podcast, please send me an email and or even DM me on my various social media platforms and I'll try my best to get back to you so we can have you on the show. Remember, the goal and the vision is simple to amplify African voices in science technology and to and share it to the world. So let's do that. Let's do that. Um, Also, to support the show, please click on the support the show link you know any amount will go a long way and honestly I really really appreciate it now let's get into today's episode my guest today is Dr. Alice Mbewe from Malawi Dr. Alice is a translational science champion if you don't know what this is it means that she's bridging the gap between discovery science and impactful healthcare at the organization where she works tune in as she also shares the roots of her science her academic journey and tells us more about the faith-based side project that she has called fill my cup on instagram tune in to hear about all of this and of course so much more let's go hi dr alice welcome to the show Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here. I'm so excited. You know, it's been a long time coming and I'm glad (laughs) that we've got this down and done. Um, So for the purpose of everybody getting to know you, can you just tell us briefly, who is Alice, where are you from, where you're currently based and just in short, what do you do? Wow. Okay. So my name is Alice Timbewe. So that's Alice Talita Mbewe. I am from Malawi. I grew up in England and I'm currently based in Malawi at the moment. And I work as a translation science champion at the Malawi Liverpool Welcome Research Program in Blantyre. So that's what I, that's a little bit about me. (laughs) Oh, fantastic. We're going to get into um, obviously what you do a little bit later in the show. Yes. But, um, I wanted to chat to you. Uh, You said to me that you are a mom and a sister and obviously a daughter uh, to someone as well. Um, I wanted to ask away from the sciences, right? Because you are a scientist and all these other roles as you as an individual. How do these roles, um, do you think, make you more of like a holistic person to be a better version of yourself in the other areas of your life? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, yeah, so I'm a mum to a nine-year-old son. He'll be 10 soon. His name is Josiah. And I'm a sister to six siblings. Well, f- uh, five now. Wow. One of, yeah, we lost one in 2021, but we're still six oh. siblings, yes. And, um, mm. yeah, I think it makes a huge difference because, you know, the 
these are key people in my life that have such a huge impact. When I think about my son, for example, you know, when I'm going to work, even if I'm tired or even if I'm a bit stressed out, just by me thinking about him helps me to be consistent. Mm. Yeah, so I really think that the key people that you, we have in our lives, not just only for me, but for everybody else, they really have a huge impact on how we do things, on how we think and just the drive that we have you know we become people that are more inspired we become people that are more consistent we become people that are more driven just simply because we we are living a holistic life and life is not just for ourselves and no man is an island so for me the people that you have mentioned that are key to me, my my siblings, my mom, my son, they all have a huge impact in how I live life, whether it's at work, whether it's outside of work. Mm, mm. No, that honestly makes sense. And you know, we are because of um, who we are around us. And it's exactly what you said that, you know, we are inspired by these people, we motivated. And mm. also, I think um, they also ground you because sometimes Sometimes, yes. you know, it, sometimes oh, yes. in, in one specific area, they can be like, ah, oh, Dr. Alice, Dr. Alice. And at home, you're like, hey, listen, mom. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, if, you know, for example, for on I think it was just on Thursday, a friend of mine, well, she's like a, a, a distant relative friend. Mm family you know one of those african settings where she's a friend but family <laughs> and uh, she had invited me to her church and so for for easter so i went so she's always just known me as alice so somebody came up to her and said is that dr alice and so she looked at me and thought what <laughs> 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 who are you talking about this is just Alice you know so so we are kind of like we're the same person but then also fulfill mm-hmm. different roles in the different spaces that we go into which is very interesting <laughs> yeah no that that's honestly so true and I think especially like you said that people who have known you for a long time or our family it's like oh my goodness why is this you, you're that big like you're really that big <laughs> exactly um, she was so surprised <laughs> speaking of people and people who have known you for a long time before you were dr alice before you were mom before let's take it back to the very beginning right did you always know that you know getting into the field of science is always um, something that you want to do or were there people, other influences that that kind of influenced your journey into the science field? I would say yes and no. I would say I've always had an interest in science. Well, initially, I actually wanted to be a medical doctor. I remember when course, I was about yeah. six or seven years old, I had an operation for my appendix. I had appendicitis. And ever since then, Mm. I was like, I want to help people in the same way that this doctor has helped other people. So I went on this journey of just being very interested in the human body. And I remember if my mom would be cutting up chicken, I'd be very interested in like the liver and seeing what's inside it and what's happening. Mm. And then over the years, I just, just developed this love for science And I was still trying to pursue the medical route, but at the same time, I just became interested in in just the science side of it, in particular immunology, actually. Mm. But having said that, I also really, really loved talking. I loved listening to people. Mm. So as much as I wanted to take the medical route, when I was doing my A-levels, I was like, I really love psychology. I'm very interested in the mind and want to know what is happening in the mind and thought, oh, maybe one day I could actually be a psychologist, just, you know, just thinking out loud to myself. But at the time, my dad wasn't very keen on the whole psychology thing because back then therapists were not very common and or not, it wasn't a lucrative um, career, yes. especially here in Africa. So he was thinking, okay, you're you're here in England at the moment, but eventually you'll go back to Malawi. There's no mm. such thing as therapists. So I kind of gave up on the therapy side of things and then just carried on pursuing the medical research and then just ended up being a 
a scientist, which is what I am now. Oh, fantastic. It's And it's um, pretty interesting that it took that one time when you had a doctor who obviously had such a huge impact on you to kind of birth that mm-hmm. um, that love for you being a scientist. Um, you said that you're born in Malawi, grew up in England. Um, so where did you do your 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 actual studies in terms of the medical research? You said you were interested in, in you in immunology, not necessarily doctor route. So what exactly did you study, um, and where did you study? Did you study in in the in the UK? Yes, I did. So I did all my schooling, well, majority of my schooling in the UK from primary all the way through to university. So my first degree is in biomedical sciences Mm. from the from Liverpool John Moores University. And then my master's is in immunology of infectious diseases from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And then I also have a PhD in viral immunology from the University of Oxford. So that's my trail of being a scientist (laughs) fantastic and i mean such uh such a uh brilliant academics you have there um (laughs) from the various institutions uh so how was that transition you studied in the uk then you came back to work in africa or malawi to be specific Mm -hmm. was there a huge culture shock for you if any not really, not at all, actually, because what my parents did very well, amongst other things, is they kept us very culturally grounded. So every holiday, every six-week holiday during the summer holidays in England, whilst the other kids were going elsewhere, we were coming back home. Mm. We were coming to Malawi mm. pretty much every year. And we did yeah. that consistently. Maybe I missed, out of the 30 years, I probably missed about five years. So, okay. yes, yeah, so every year we would come home, we would go to the village, to, we would eat all the food that we, you know, that, that people eat locally. We would go to the market. So it wasn't a cultural shock for me at all. And in 2005, yes. 2007, mm-hmm. I was working here as well. I was working at John Hopkins um, University Project. So they have a project here in Malawi. So a research program, rather. So I was working here for those two years. So I think also that really helped me to integrate into the society and to learn a bit more about what the culture actually means rather than just being here for the six weeks or two weeks or, or three weeks. So that really helped a lot. I remember when I first mm-hmm. came in 2005 at, at John Hopkins, people were laughing at how I spoke in Chishewa. So <clears throat> that really got me annoyed. <laughs> I made it a point to make sure that I'm going to learn how to speak like a local Malawian. So I'd go to the, to church, the Jichewa service. I would read the Jichewa section in the newspapers. I'd listen Mm. to Jichewa music. And now when I speak Jichewa, people don't believe that it's me. (laughs) Really? Oh my goodness. Now I'm going (laughs) to. Yeah. So you've lost, so you're able to, what do they call it? Code switch perfectly. 100%. I, so it's interesting. People say that I, when I speak English, it's as if I've never lived in Malawi. And when I speak to share with it's as if I've never yeah. lived outside of Malawi. Oh, fantastic. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's really and that's great. A, and I, I, I'm glad that, you know, I'm able to do that. I'm glad that I'm able to also pass that on to my son. You know, mm. I, when, when I'm with him, I, he can't speak to Cheryl fully, but at least he understands some words and, and uh, he eats in Sima and, you know, mm-hmm. dives into all the local things that we do here when he's in Malawi. Oh, amazing, <laughs> amazing, amazing. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm laughing that your code switch is good. Mine is still very like, mm, yeah, no. Oh, really? Can tell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe I also just need to go and sit because I go holidays, so I don't stay in Malawi for long periods of time. So maybe uh-huh. once I go okay. back and I stay, my code switching will be, um, will be just as good as yes. yours. <laughs> and even the holidays, the ho- you can utilize the holidays, go to the yeah. market, speak uh, to 
go to the villages and that's how you that's how you dig in and there's no returning after that <laughs> <laughs> no that's for sure that's for sure okay so you said you are now in malawi you are working and you're a transitional scientist at the malawi liverpool trust um can you tell us yes. what that is actually i don't know what a translational scientist is so uh can you give us an overview of what that is and then also touching on to the other work that you do yeah, sure. So <clears throat> there are there is an actual career called tra a translation of scientists. So now people actually do a, an entire master's or even a PhD in just becoming a translation of scientists. So what I am is I run a department for translation of science. I run I'm, I lead the, that unit. So what that means is, you know, in in the normal the best way I can explain it is in the normal academic setting, the mm -hmm. main <clears throat> measurement of success is publishing papers, whether we're publishing in nature, in science, whatever yes. it is, we want to publish. The more papers we publish, the more we align that to this is what success looks like in our institution, or this is mm -hmm. what success looks like in that specific um, research topic. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that we're not just applying for grants, doing the research, publishing and then applying for more grants, doing the research and then publishing again. And then it's a continuous cycle, which there's nothing wrong with it. But what we really wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that the actual science or research we're doing is being translated into having a health impact. So we look at the whole spectrum from beginning, which is the discovery science side, all mm -hmm. the way through to, to implementation. And then we try to help researchers understand what that process looks like and also what steps they need to take or what steps they need to consider even when they are doing their basic research or when they're doing their discovery research like what is it that they can do to move along with their steps to translate this information that they have just discovered what does it mean for the end user which is the human being what does it mean for the mm -hmm. person who is going through these health issues what does that look like so the normal terminology is from bench to bedside a great example mm -hmm. an easy example <clears throat> for us to understand is h um we have a, a hiv self testing kits that was this, that was done yes. in the lab and then the end user is obviously the person who would be who will be actually using that testing kit. So with translation of science, it has two main arms. You have the non-commercial side, which is things like policy, um, uh, trials of improved practice, changing guidelines. And then you also have the commercial side, so which is the example I've just given, like the HIV self-testing kit, which can actually go into commercialization. So companies like GSK, um, they are very, very good at a glass. So Glasgow Smith Klein, they're very, very good at the translation because then they're doing drug discovery. They do that in the lab, and then the end user is implemented. Um, so it goes through the entire process from discovery all the way through to preclinical, clinical stages, and then all the way through into being used into the public health system. And there's the end user, which is it being used by the patient. And obviously, they're selling these mm. um, medications in the pharmacies or in the ho in the hospitals or, or even in different countries. So that's what the whole spectrum of translation of science looks like. And we have seen a huge change once we introduced this unit at, at Malawi Level Welcome um, Research Program. We have really seen a huge change in just how the researchers are thinking because it's more, it was more to do with the cultural shift. And we wanted to make sure that mm. people are not just thinking about publishing, but they're thinking about impact. Yeah. That what is the impact that you're going mm. to have from your research? Oh, this is amazing. It's amazing because um, I. this is also something that I've also been keenly interested. And I don't know then mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, but I suppose this is like you said, it's more like in the health, the health side. But does this not also link with the field of science communication? Because also is that instead of just publishing, but also just like how you effectively communicate your work to the people, be it policy or the people or the end user as well? Mm -hmm. Yes, partly, partly. I mean, we do work along, we do have a science communication department where I work. Yeah. So... 
we do um, some work with them, especially on public engagement, for them to allow them to understand that what is actual translation of science. So we <clears throat> record videos of the researchers doing this okay. work, we're explaining some of this work so that the public are able to understand it. Um, so although it doesn't really go so much into the communication side, but it is mm. part of it. But the main thing is what we want to do is we want to make sure that your research is having impact. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Which is which is honestly why we do science at the end of the day, exactly. not to just publish. It's because of the this new culture shift, which you also already mentioned that um, that success is is only equated to the 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 impact factors or the the, the number of publications, et cetera, et cetera. Not necessarily the impact that you are actually trying to do. Mm -hmm, exactly, exactly. And if we think about the history of science, so all those people that discovered mm -hmm. certain things, they were discovering them because they wanted to solve a problem and they wanted mm -hmm. to have some level of impact. It was never about, oh, let me solve this problem so that I can publish. It was always let me solve this problem <laughs> so that so that I can help. It, whether it was smallpox, yes. whether it was whatever it was, yeah. you know, it was always let me solve this problem. Let me try and solve this problem so that people can be helped. Mm. Yeah. yeah. No, I I think honestly, I hope more institutions um, need to implement that branch in their organizations, especially like research, yes. because I think sometimes the line, the the lines are getting very blurred where it's only just, there's, hu there's a huge focus only on the publication side. And I'm sure other scientists who are probably listening to this are like, Alice, come to my institution <laughs> and, teach, and tell yes. them, yes. and tell them that there's more <laughs> to life than you know, publishing or perishing. Yes, exactly. And, you know, Welcome Trust, so the, well, now they're just called Welcome. They've removed the trust word, but the um, Welcome, but I'll just you say Welcome Trust because that's what majority of people are familiar with. They mm -hmm. have done a fantastic job in sort of pushing this agenda. So even our department our unit is actually funded by them and they are i think i believe about 25 other institutions that mm. have got the same award as us or the same grant as us which is prioritizing this translation of science agenda and um whether mm. it's in, i think there's some in thailand in in lots in england like oxford birmingham london school of tropical medicine uh, Lund liverpool school of tropical medicine so there's so many mm. in, in other institutions that have received this award so that we make sure that the science we have we are doing is relevant and it has impact yes mm. Mm, which is absolutely brilliant kudos to you and your whole unit and um, I hope more and more institutions uh, develop this work because I'm a firm believer on mm. the impact on on why are we yes. doing science and not just <laughs> <laughs> and not just and not just to for the science to sit in a journal or or to sit in a lab yes, somewhere exactly. but how is it affecting mm. the people mm. And speaking of how things affect people, mm. um, I think now that I'm, I actually just had an epiphany that you said you wanted to be a doctor to help people and um, the way that you were helped. And maybe you are not necessarily a doctor, but you are doing that in the work that you're doing um, at, <laughs> at Welcome. And also <laughs> on the yes. side, actually, you also have, um, you, you currently run a faith-based personal development platform called Fill My Cup for Dynamic female leaders um running after their god-given vision yes. and honestly this is how i met you because um a mutual friend of ours mara posted about your events and i was like oh my goodness who's this woman <laughs> this looks absolutely brilliant and uh well you know the rest is history and that's why we're here so can you tell the audience what the filma cup um was all about and why you actually started it when you did 
Okay, so maybe I will start with why I started it. So in 2017, yes. 2015, between 2015 and 2017, I went through a season of very intense depression. And um, it was through that season that I felt <clears throat> that beyond me be feeling the way I was feeling and just having sort of like mental health issues or just struggling with my mental health, I should say. I also discovered this whole new world of personal development, but faith-based, which I had never known before. And that is what kept me going. Mm. And that's what even took me out of that season. And during that season, I had... Um, a vision, I should say. God gave me a vision. And I saw myself speaking to several women, inspiring them and empowering them through the word, but also building them up. So personal development. And I had, to be honest with you, I had kind of forgotten about it after some years. And it was only in 2021, yes, coming towards 2021 mm -hmm. or, or entering to end, end of 2021, that I remember that, oh my goodness, like I'm this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I'm very passionate about it. So what had happened all throughout those years, which I didn't realize was God preparing me for what is now through my cup was that I was coaching women. I had those several women that would just, you know, um, grab my attention, whether it was through social media or through a friend. And I would coach them through mm -hmm. several different things, whether it was academics, whether it was life issues, whether it was marriage, whatever it was, I just found myself continuously being in a space where I am using the experiences that I had in my past to help somebody. And uh, so one day I was listening to, I, I really wish I mm. could remember whether it was a podcast or a sermon, or I was listening to something. And the person said, fill my cup. And mm. right away, I knew that that is exactly what I need to call this platform. So by that time, I had already just side or had really kind of come to me that oh now is the right time to take this on and actually help other women and create a platform mm. so that's how it started we started off by just having 12 women and we share on vision we want people to really understand to create a vision for themselves and to know or at least to be inspired into discovering their purpose so that's the second thing and the third thing is to know that they're a leader in their own right so we also teach leadership skills one of the things we say is that leadership is action and not position you know there are so many we need to demystify this thing of that mm. if you are a leader then you are in an actual position of leadership because then what does that mean for all the other people are they not leaders yeah. too <laughs> are they also not you know you can think yeah. about a, a a woman who is at home running a business looking after four kids is she not a leader surely she is she may not be working and in the she totally is exactly she, she, she is. may not be yeah. working in a position of conventional leadership like a manager or some kind of a boss but she's certainly a leader and that's what we wanted to do we want to make sure that women are embracing this idea of the fact that they are a leader in their own right so we teach about self-leadership and then we just introduce people to the different um <clears throat> terminologies or the different leadership styles i should say so we have been running events since 2022 we i think we have run about seven events so far we do both private and public events so the private ones will just be me inviting specific people from anything from very small numbers to larger numbers <clears throat> and this february for the first time we also introduced through my cup young ladies so before that it was always from the age of 25 going upwards but now we introduced up young ladies between the ages of 17 yeah. to 24 and we had about 65 young women which is amazing you know and we're really excited to kind of see where that goes and how that grows and now the men are also asking what about us men so we're also considering how we're going to do that 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. So that's that's pretty much it with Fill My Cup. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. And um, I love that, you know, in your pain or in you found purpose from your depression and whatnot. Mm. Um, it was it was purposeful yes. and it intentful. And you are obviously yeah. helping so many women, um, you know, be the person who they are. And um, so how often do you host these events? I know you said that you you had a recent one with the young people and maybe potentially with the men as well. So how often do you host these events? Well, because I still work full time. <laughs> <laughs> there's that. They, yes, there's that. There is that. I Yes, because I work full time, uh, it's a little bit tricky to have um, and then also just because of life dynamics, we've tried to put a calendar in place, especially for 2023. Mm. But then mm. life happened. The cyclone happened just a few weeks ago, which is the week that we're yes. supposed to have another event. Oh, and we had to shift yeah. it to April. And then other times it's maybe I have work engagement. So at the moment, our calendar is um, is set, but not not concrete Mm. (laughs) per se because it has to go along with just my availability and availability of the other members of the team as well so this year we have had two events we had one in England and we had one here in Malawi we're having our third one next month so that will be a private exclusive retreat with just 10 women, 10 to 12 women maximum. Mm -hmm. And that's in May. So the one after that will most probably, well, is scheduled for July. It's scheduled for July. And then the one after that is scheduled for October. And then we'll have a final one in December. Oh, wow. No, so you do. They are quite often. Oh, my God. Please give yourself credit. <laughs> That's a lot of work, even as you're working and as you have life. Like, yes. That is that is a lot of um, events. And yeah, no, kudos to you. I wish you all of the best and I hope Thank you impact you. Thank you so, much. so many people. Um, as we close off, I wanted to ask if you have any words of wisdom for anybody who's listening, be it about life in general or just about Mm. your experience as being a scientist okay maybe i'll start off with the words of wisdom i think i will do people that are listening a great injustice if i don't share anything about purpose which is something i'm very very passionate about um so i i read a i read a lot of dr the late dr mars monroe books and listen to a lot of his teachings and one of the things that he always used to say is that if you don't understand the purpose of a thing <clears throat> abuse is inevitable so i always give an example of a pen if you are using a pen to clean the floor you're going to abuse the pen and it will break at some mm-hmm. point mm-hmm. or whatever it is if you're not using something in the rightful way of what it was intended for abuse is always inevitable and it's the same thing with our own lives many people don't actually know what their purpose is or don't even have a vision for their lives and therefore abuse is inevitable and abuse we're not talking about saying you'll be I don't know you'll be sort of like abusing yourself in that kind of way but you are now you would now be living a life that was not intended for you And one of the things that I really want for people to understand Mm. or at least walk away from, to walk away with is this idea that you were, you are here for a purpose. We only here for a season. We're not going to be in this world forever. (laughs) Nobody's going to be in this world forever. Even me, we're here for a season and it is for, a purpose it is for a reason so i would urge you to begin to discover what that looks like what is your purpose what vision is it that you can create sit down look at the bible start reading start praying start spending time with god and writing things down in habakkuk 2 2 it says write the vision and make it plain and it's as simple as that write the vision and make it plain the moment you start writing you start seeing that things are coming out like huh I didn't even know this was inside mm. of me. Mm. I didn't even know that I was created for for more than what I am doing right now. 
So that's one thing that I would share about purpose and me as a scientist, I would say it's been, it's really been a journey of pay, being patient to get into where I am now in my career. And I'm still, I still see myself as a very early career researcher. So there's a whole steps, the whole load of steps that I need to get through and I, which I'm excited about. And um, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to whatever transition I will go through in the years to come. I'm looking forward to the things I will learn and we can never stop learning, whether it's me doing another course or learning from other people. We never, ever stop learning, especially as researchers, we can never stop learning. So that's, those are my final words. Wow. Amazing. Definitely, definitely. We, uh, <laughs> I, I am inspired by everything that you said. And I hope somebody who is also listening is also inspired by the words that you shared, your story, and um, hopefully they get to, um, they get motivated or inspired again to, <laughs> in, in, in their own areas of their life. Um, thank you so mm -hmm. much for coming on and talking with me. No, thank you. It's for been having such me. a pleasure. <laughs> it's been such a pleasure. And to everybody else who's listening, thank you so much for tuning into another episode of the Root of the Science podcast with your girl and with an E. Until next time, goodbye.